Well, good morning. Well, some of you are awake, I guess. I tried. You, you tried too, Justin. I heard you. We're glad you're here this morning. And uh, if you're visiting with us, whether live stream or here today, welcome. We're glad you're here. And uh, just by way of explanation for those who are visiting or watching for the first time, we've been walking through the book of, of Matthew. And uh, another reminder, Matthew was written to the Jewish people, from a Jew to a Jew, to make them understand why Christ came, who he was, and what he came to do. So some of the things that Matthew says are very pointed to those who were Hebrew. As we get closer to the end of this book, we're, we only have a couple of chapters left. As we get closer to the end of this book, it kind of is fitting that it's going to coincide with uh, Resurrection Sunday. So we've got about three weeks until Easter, and so we'll end the book of Matthew on Resurrection Sunday, and then God will lead us in another direction uh, after that. But that's where we are in the book of Matthew. So if you will, turn with me to the 26th chapter. We've been in the 26th chapter for a couple of Sundays, but this will be the last Sunday. We'll be there. Well, next is the last Sunday. I uh, don't promise anything. Uh, <laughs> but on the 26th chapter, we're looking at verses 26 through 30. Now, uh, if you were here last Sunday, you would say, well, Brother Gordon, why did we do that last Sunday? Well, we did read some of it when we did the Lord's Supper last Sunday. But I want you to look with me this morning at a very uh, different way about those few verses. If you'll notice, I've entitled the message today, The Last Will and Testament of Jesus Christ. Now, when we, uh, in our normal activities in life, when we get closer to the end of life, sometimes when you think about it, some people decide this is the time we need to make a will. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many people there have one. I'm just going to say, do you have a will? Okay, you think about that. Some do, some don't. Why do we do that? We do that so that those who are here after we're gone will know what to do or what we want done with our, I'm going to call it legacy, because that's what I'm talking about this morning. Not necessarily our property and our money and all of the things like that, but what we want to leave as a legacy for those to come. And so when you come to these passages, there is a phrase here that Jesus uses that talks about his last will and testament. Now, you look at me kind of funny because you said, Gordon, how in the world can you get the Lord's Supper to be the last testament of Jesus Christ? Very easy because he says something to his disciples. Let's read it one more time. Chapter 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There's the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? He said, this is what a new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So as we talk about a will, we talk about a covenant, a new testament uh, in the Greek, it's diothike. That's what it means. And it means covenant. It means a will. And so Jesus said to his disciples as they were there in the upper room, this is the new covenant which I'm going to shed for all mankind to be remissions for their sin. Up until this time, the Old Testament and the covenant that made with, God made with the Hebrew people was that I will be your people, you will be my, I will be your God, you would be my people, and you would keep my covenant and those laws that I gave you. Now, Matthew wrote this because he knew the readers would understand what he meant by covenant. When he said, this is going to be a new covenant, they understood. This is going to be my testament to you. It's going to be my will to you. What happens after I'm no longer here. And you remember from last Sunday, this was about two days before he was to be arrested and tried. So Jesus says to his disciples, we're up here doing the Passover meal, but I want you to understand that this Passover meal is going to have specific and long-term impacts on the rest of the world from now on. There's going to be a new will. There's going to be a new 
opportunity, if you will, after I'm gone. Now, isn't that what wills are all about? Some of you have probably gone through what my wife and, and her sister and brother have gone through lately. Their, their dad passed away very recently, and they're in the process now of looking at what his will said, what he wanted done after he was gone, and they are faithfully executing that uh, as we go through these months. Jesus was trying to give the disciples something to hang on to. Did they understand it? Some of them didn't. A lot of them didn't. Would they understand it? All of them would come to understand it after his death. But a testimony or or a will or the last will and testament of anyone is something that we usually do so people will understand what we want done. Now, what did he have to pass on to them? If you read the New Testament, you'll find out that Jesus didn't have anything. The Bible said he didn't have any place to lay his head. All he had was what he had on his back. That's all he needed because his legacy and what he wanted to pass on to us in his will was the legacy of the forgiveness of sin. Up until that time, and again, we're writing to Jewish people. Matthew's writing to Jews. Up until that time, they were understanding that to be uh, forgiven, not forgiven so much as our sins being covered, that they had to take animals to the temple. And there the priests would sacrifice those animals and those would uh, be killed so that their blood would cover their sins. And it was done annually. Now, when Jesus came, the covenant, the new covenant he was making with the world was this. I'm going to come and I'm going to cover you. No, I'm going to forgive you because of the blood I shed and my body being hung on the cross. That's a big difference, folks, than being covered and then being forgiven. So if you don't understand it today, as we come to know Christ as our Savior, He not only covers our sins, but He also forgives our sin like they never happened. Now, I tell people this all the time, and they look at me and say, well, I know what I've been, and I know how rough I've been. I know how bad I've been. Do you think Jesus forgives all of that? God's Word says He does. He says, as we come to know him as our Savior, we accept the sacrifice that he made for us out of faith, uh, his grace and our faith in him. He says that when we come and confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So his legacy, not money, not possessions, he didn't have any of those, but his legacy was he left the ability to forgive sin. Now, that's a big thing because without that, without that ability, without that sacrifice for us, we would still be under the law. We'd still be sacrificing goats and calves. And this is a good opportunity to stop right here. I know there's a very famous goat today and Reagan raised a goat and she got first place She got first place. Isn't that great? We are proud of our kids, and we're proud of our young people to do something good. And she had the first place goat at the, the, uh, what was that, a fair? Roberts County Fair. But we no longer have to depend on the blood of goats and cows and sheep because Jesus has come, and he says, my legacy, my gift to you is forgiveness. Is forgive. Don't you like to be forgiven? We have had differences in my house at times. Differences when my wife looks at me and she gives me that look, and I know I have messed up. But it sure is nice when she finally looks at me with forgiveness. Now, you might say, how long does that take? A while. But don't you like to be forgiven? We all mess up. We all make mistakes. And if you're perfect, then you're right up there with Jesus. But I don't know if anybody is. But we like to be forgiven. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. This is my blood. This is my body. It's shed for you because of the new covenant I'm going to make with you. The new will. 
I'm going to make with you. And that is, if you believe in me and you trust in me, I will forgive you. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they were all just aghast by this because, you see, they said no one can forgive sin but God alone. And no one for, can forgive sin except you go through the rituals in the temple. And he was so radical and he said, in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my sins would be forgiven. Not only that, he passed on his legacy to us, but he also said that this is the way it has to be. I want to, you don't turn over there, but I will. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9, there's a few verses. Now, I'm going to use a word that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, the word is testator. Anybody know what that word is? If you know what testator means, raise your hand. Okay. Boy, y'all need to know this word. If you have relatives, you need to know this word. It's in the Bible. It's a lawyer word, but it's in the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 9, beginning verse 16, for where there is, there is a testament, there must be also of necessity the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. How about that? The Bible talks about the testator. That is the person who is going to make the will. That's the person who has to die so the will is in effect. And Jesus called himself the testator. I am going to be the one who is sacrificed. I am going to be the one who is killed. And when I am killed, my will for you is through that there is forgiveness. That's simple, isn't it? Now, did he have to go through probate? You know what probate is? It's bad. That's when no one leaves a will, and you have to go to court to decide who gets what. <laughs> okay, I'm not going there. I, I've told my sister-in-law a joke. This, I'm not going there, Wanda. I'm not going there. But there's all kinds of stories out there about what happens when someone dies and they have no will. I will tell you one quickly. I had an uncle. His name was Uncle Joe. And Uncle Joe married late in life. He was almost 50 before he ever married. He married a lady who had never married. So you can imagine that was some kind of wedding. She was almost 50. She, he was almost 50. And they married. They had no children. But Uncle Joe did finally die, but he had no will. Mm -hmm. Uncle Joe had property. Uncle Joe had possessions. He didn't have a whole lot of money because he put, put all of his money in property and things like that. Do you know, I got a phone call from a lawyer, and they said, are you Gordon Knight? I said, yes, I am. Are you uh, Joe Walker's great nephew? I said, yes, I am. My mother was a Walker and her uncle, so he was my great uncle. And he says, well, I want to ask your permission to dissolve some of the property. And I said, I'm only his great nephew. He said, yes, but he had no children. He didn't have a will, so we've got to figure out what to do with his property. There's a lot of confusion. And then there's also people who say, hey, I want the house, yeah. or I want the cattle, or I want the land, or I want the problem. You know, it's just a big mess. Mm. So you see, when Jesus told the disciples, this was going to be my new covenant with you, my new testament with you, he was setting in order what would happen because of his death. And the book of Hebrews said, there has to be a testator, there has to be one to die so this can take place. Jesus knew the week that he entered that <clears throat> temple that he was going to die at the end of the week. He knew it. And he was making preparations for that. Matter of fact, it says that if he had not died, there would be no New Testament. I hope you go away from here this morning understanding that there's the Old Testament, there's the New Testament, and all of it had come together in the person of Jesus Amen. so that we might be able to be forgiven of our sin. He had no property, he had no money, but he had something that's greater far than money or property or any possession we could ever have. He had the ability to forgive our sin, to cleanse our heart, and to make us righteous before God the Father. 
I don't know that any will I've ever read. I, I made a will. I've changed it four or five times. I, you know, if my kids are bad, I pull them out. If they're good, I put them back in. I knew of a guy who did that. And we looked at his will. There was um, individual pieces of uh, notebook paper there and say, uh, you know, they did this, take them out. Then he would recant and put one in and says, no, they're good, put them back in. It's, it's all the way we look at it. That's how humans look at stuff like that. But when Jesus came and he said, this is my covenant, this is the blood of my body and my broken body to make a new covenant with you, he settled it. So for anyone who comes and asks forgiveness, they might become forgiven. But further than that, God says that as we come and we ask forgiveness and we lay ourselves before him and on his mercy... We also become adopted. Amen. Adopted. Praise the Lord. Now, all of us in here who know Christ as Savior are adopted sons and daughters of God. That's what the Word of God says. We say, you know, Jesus, he died thousands of years ago. Doesn't matter. But what he came to do with that testament, with the, was that will, was to give us the ability to be heirs. It's very important to be an heir in a will. Most of the time, that is the children, right? And so, as Jesus explained it, and the apostles finally understood it, they said, because of his blood, because of the broken body, we are able to become sons and daughters of God equal to Christ. That's not blasphemy to say that. That's what the Word of God says. That we become sons and daughters, heirs with Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, the other question is, do you feel like that? You say, Brother Gordon, I don't feel like I'm like Jesus. Well, in one way you are. Because you have put your faith and trust in Him, the only way to the Father. And if we don't do that, you are going to be heirs of the kingdom. Uh, pretty simple stuff. Jesus spelled it out. He said, listen, in order to become a part of the kingdom of God, you must come through me. You must ask forgiveness of your sin because I sacrificed my blood and my body for you. And if you believe that, because of the grace of God, he saved you. We use a lot of churchy words like get saved and all that kind of stuff. And I've been saved. What it simply means is you've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. Um, there's a, a TV show on the, uh, what, I don't know what channel it is. I don't have channels. I got, I got a cable. But, but there's a judge, and if you go into him, you have your case uh, presented to this judge on TV, right? And they say, uh, there's a, 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 a thing at the bottom that says, you will agree to what the judge says on TV. <laughs> That's as simple as that. He has all kind of people coming in there and all kind of offenses. This one guy came in the other day and he says judge do you recognize me he says I sure do counselor uh, you've been in my court several times as defending uh, uh, people who've done uh, whatever he said yes sir I'm retired he says well what are you doing in my court now he said sir I got a parking ticket that I wasn't even there for <laughs> and he says what do you mean he says I wasn't even in the area uh, that they say I was in to get a parking ticket he says well do you have a pretty good uh, alibi? He said, I sure do. I was in the hospital. <laughs> and he says, there's no way I could have parked my car there. He said, well, I believe you. You're forgiven. You know what that meant? He didn't have to pay hundred and something dollars. That's what that meant. But when Jesus says to us, we are forgiven of whatever you've done in this life. Guys, that's, that's liberating. That's liberating. That we can walk through life knowing that our sins have been forgiven, even the ones we will commit. We commit them because we're human. We commit them because we have choices to make, and sometimes even with the Holy Spirit in our lives, we still make bad decisions. Because you see, God wants He wants individuals. He doesn't want puppets. He wants individuals to love Him, to respect Him. So Jesus left a will. He left us his forgiveness of sin. And it's in effect now because he died for us. But lastly of all, there's some conditions. 
Oh, yeah. You knew I'd get to there, didn't you? There are some conditions. In order to receive what we should inherit because of the death of Jesus, there are conditions. In Hebrews, it says there's no testament without a testator, and there's no will without that person dying. So Christ has died. He has risen, and we're going to celebrate that in just a few weeks. But there are some conditions that we have to meet. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we have to work for this. I'm just saying we have to meet the conditions. Christ has already done the work, but we have to meet the conditions. Now, what are the conditions? Well, like everything else, you have to be born in the family. You have to be born into the family. How do we do that? You know, a man asked Christ one time, says, what must I do to be saved? He says, you must be born again. He says, wait a minute. I'm a full-grown man. How can I go back again and be born again? He said, that's not the kind of birth I'm talking about. You must be, hello, I'm sorry. You must be born of the water and of the blood and of the spirit. And what that means is it's a different kind of birth. So first condition is you must be born again. And the only way to do that is to understand that by God's grace, he sent his son Jesus to send his body and his blood to the cross to die for our sin. And when we understand that and we ask forgiveness, we come to the place where we are born again. That's, that's one of those churchy words. But it simply means we've understood that we're sinners and we need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and we accept that as a gift. Okay, we've met that condition. What else? Well, we must promise to live for him and his precepts. Where do we get those? It's right here. Right here. We promise to love him and to honor him and to keep his precepts. In other words, this is the guide that we go through life with. Not the 12 easy steps. <laughs> Not the fly-by-night, this is how you uh, improve yourself. Uh, it's funny, you walk in a, a, a place that sells books. We do have books still, don't we? And you go by and you look at those books and it says self-help books. I've always wondered about that because there's hundreds of them. Do I have to read all of them? All I have to read is one. This is the book. So, conditions. We need to become an heir. We also need to promise to love and honor him and to read his instructions for life. Now, some people would argue that the last thing we must do is to be baptized. I know we're in a Baptist church. I know that's why we got our name. But God help me, we don't need to be baptized to be saved. But we need to do the first two. But we also want to do the third thing. Someone asked me one time, preacher, if I'm not baptized, am I saved? I said, yep. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Yes, I have. Do you love him with all your heart? Yes, I do. Do you keep his precepts, his commandments? I'm trying to, but it's hard. <laughs> have you been baptized? Nope, but I want to be because I want to follow him in baptism because he said we should do that. Right. Has no saving power, but we should do that. Some people say, well, Christians, especially Baptists, are, are kind of, uh, you know, splitting hairs here. No, no. Jesus is the one that saves us because of what he did on Calvary. And if we love him, we want to do what he says we should do. Is that not right? I had a lady in my church long ago that had never been baptized because she was afraid of water. I thought, how can anybody be afraid of water? You drink it, you get it out of the tap. I mean, she, she, I've never been swimming. I've never been in a boat. I just don't get in water, and I want to be baptized. I said, you're in trouble. Because <laughs> you got to get in the water. And I said, let's pray about that for a while. And we did. We did. And she finally came and says, preacher, I think I'm ready. When she walked up to the baptistry to get in there, she was just about to lose it. And I walked over to her and I said, did you pray about this? She said, yes, I have. And God told me I, I should do this. I said, if he's told you you should do this, 
then let's trust him to get you through it. She went in, we baptized her, she came up and she said, you know something? I don't know what I've been afraid of all these years. <laughs> Isn't that great? So we have to meet the conditions to be heirs to receive the will. And the question is, have you done that? That's simple enough, isn't it? Have you understood who Christ is? By the grace of God, he's offered himself a sacrifice for us. And by our faith, we receive that and we ask him into our hearts. And because he died the death that we should die on Calvary, we today are his sons and daughters and we're heirs to the kingdom of God. And the only way to do that is to trust in Christ. Amen. Trust in Christ. If you're watching today and you've never done that, that is how you are saved. Very simple. If you're here in the room today, if you've never done that, that's how you're saved. For those of us who already know Christ as our Savior, we are sons and daughters of Christ already. What we do is we live like it. My mother and dad never sent me out that they didn't tell me, Son, remember who you came from. I can remember that time and time again. They would send me out. Either mom or dad would say, Son, remember who, where you're from. Especially when I became a teenager. What were they saying? They were saying, we raised you to be a moral, good person. Don't go out there and be an idiot. Yeah. God saved you to share that faith with other people and to live like he instructs us to live. Don't go out there, Christian, and act like everybody else. That's what that means. So if you need Christ as your Savior, you can do that today. If you need to clean up your the way you live, you've already been saved. Just clean up the way you're living. You can do that today. If you need a place to come and say, I want to be a part of this family, I already know that I'm a son or daughter of Christ, you can do that today. But the last testament and will of Jesus Christ is already written. We can read it. We can understand it very plain. You don't have to guess about what he wants to do. He wants to come in and forgive you of your sin and save you so that you might become a son and a daughter of Christ. The will is clear. What you do with it is your choice.